All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining. Up next, we have Heather Flannery. She's the founder and CEO of Consensus Health, a blockchain software tech company that solves large scale healthcare problems. She is passionate about proving population health and economic prosperity by building mission driven organizations that use innovative and emerging technologies. Please welcome Ms. Flannery as she discusses the topic utilizing blockchain technology in healthcare. Thank you so much for joining us, Ms. Flannery. I'm delighted to be here. How's my audio? It's perfect. Thank you so much. Feel free to share your screen whenever you're ready. All right. And I am planning on about 30 minutes for the talk and 30 minutes for, I'm hopeful, great audience Q&A. Sound, sound good? Sounds great. We should end at about 12.55. Actually, you know what? 30 minutes is great because up next we have our lunch break. So that's perfect. Terrific. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Hello, everyone. It's a it's an honor to be here today. I'm uh, I'm Heather Flanner Heather Flannery. I'm the founder and chief executive officer of Consensus Health. Uh, Consensus, spelled with a Y, is the largest pure play blockchain company, and uh, Consensus Health is a commercially independent spinoff of Consensus. Uh, that's aim is to drive the positive transformation of our industry with a family of emerging technologies, including blockchain, but not limited to blockchain. So I'm, I'm excited. I'm really excited to be here and speak with all of you today. Um, outside of my role leading Consensus Health, uh, I also am the co-chair of the Blockchain Task Force at HIMSS, the Health Information Management Systems Society, two S's at the end. And uh, if you're not already a HIMSS member, I highly recommend it uh, for, uh, for, for pre-health professionals. A incredible way to get oriented to the, I'll say the tactical, practical, technical, and engineering disciplines involved with the, uh, the underpinning of healthcare and life sciences. Uh, in addition to that, I'm involved with standards development uh, rather intensively. I chair a standards development working group at IEEE uh, dedicated to the application of blockchain and machine learning to the healthcare and life sciences industry globally. So I have a standards development perspective, a professional society perspective, and an entrepreneur's perspective. Um, Consensus Health is my fourth fourth company. Uh, it's my third, uh, third business in the healthcare and life sciences field. Um, I'm very, very passionate about the space and feel that it is a gift and an honor to be able to work in a field that means so much to me and that leaves me intrinsically motivated uh, to continue to do my, my utmost. So before I get into explaining to you what this new technology is and how it works, I wanna let you know that it's maybe a little bit further along than you might have realized. Um, you've probably heard of blockchain. You are almost assuredly believing that it's very, very new. And actually that would have been a more apt description about four years ago. Uh, now today we have uh, many of the largest healthcare and life sciences enterprises in the world actively engaged even in a public way in different kinds of experimentation and software development uh, with, with blockchain technology. One thing to know about the technology is that it is implemented in networks. That's how it is put into production. So a blockchain network is always described as a network and in part defined by its participants. And you can see here uh, that there are five very large healthcare and life sciences consortia that have formed to launch blockchain networks that are specialized for the needs of our particular industry. Uh, here in the United States, the Synaptic Health Alliance is the, uh, the first and in the largest. They were announced all the way back in April of 2018 and have been incredibly thought leading in their approach to designing, administering, governing, funding, a blockchain network specifically for the needs of healthcare. And I'll come back to telling you a little bit more about Synaptic and what they're up to, but you can see the organizations involved. Um, it's been a very substantial investment and a very significant focus. 
The Coalesce Health Alliance is formed by Blue Cross Blue Shield organizations largely, and Melody is all about blockchain facilitated federated machine learning and is anchored mainly in the EU. Uh, the Innovative Medicines Institute is a European Commission organization that has formed the largest scale public private partnership between uh, pharmaceutical and uh, pharmaceutical companies and a government in history including Pfizer, Novartis, Merck, Janssen, Novo, et cetera, and more increasing all the time in order to bring this family of technologies to the European Union in a way that is closely aligned uh, with, uh, with, with both the public and the private sector. The Health Utility Network is being uh, renamed, but is a very large consortia that on its launch will, co will cover 93 million American lives and help facilitate uh, a wide range of use cases. Um, if you don't come from the information technology space, you might not be used to hearing this word use case. Uh, it's, it's how people talk about the way a particular piece of software or a, a, a computer science innovation can be used in real life in practical terms. So I'll be using that term a lot, this use case, that use case, uh, et cetera. One thing that I, I want to emphasize is that all of these networks and the business models underpinning them are, in, are experimental. They're all early. None of these have uh, production systems running yet, though they all have sub been the subject of a great deal of investment and innovation. All of them have slightly different business, legal, financial governance, ownership constructs. Uh, one of the things that's going to be very interesting to see how it plays out in the coming years is which of these kinds of models at a detailed level actually uh, actually works well for our industry and, and how does that vary from country to country. Um, that's all going to be very, uh, very interesting and I look forward to questions about it when we get to that segment. So now now that you understand that things are well underway and that every healthcare organization providers payers pharmacies med tech, the, the, the entire, every stakeholder group is engaged with blockchain, including the professional societies, American College of Surgeons, on and on. Um, what is it? And, uh, and why is it that if you have read up on it, it seems difficult to put your finger on a precise definition? Well, th the reason for that is because blockchain as a term actually could be defined through a, a number of different lenses and they'd all be correct. It's, it's a disruptive, trans, uh, you know, transformative technology that I would liken to um, electricity, for example. And when you were in the early days of seeing electricity uh, affect a culture, it would have been quite difficult to define it exactly. Do you define it in the physics terms? Do you define it based on what it does to businesses or cultures or, or on and on? So the first thing to know about blockchain is that it's a layer on top of today's modern web. So everything you're familiar with, everything you know, everything that is comfortable and customary to you as a user, uh, it is a layer built on top of all of that. It is not a replacement for legacy information systems, and it doesn't replace uh, healthcare legacy infrastructures like EHRs, for example. Now, we will be talking about personal health records and the idea of self-sovereignty and patient sovereignty and person-centeredness and, and the implications for blockchain and that technology. That is not a replacement of legacy infrastructure because that doesn't exist today in any meaningful way. That is net new and it definitely will be bringing those changes. So the next thing to know, I mentioned that blockchain exists in networks. Uh, the, th the thing to understand is that those networks could be public, completely uh, transparent, visible to the world. Examples of that are the Bitcoin blockchain and the Ethereum mainnet. Uh, these are uh, highly transparent, completely public infrastructures that exist due to a behavioral economic miracle. They have no CEO. They have no board of directors. They have no trust that governs them. They have no stock. They have no nation. They are uh, completely global and transnational and they operate based on behavioral economic principles that are being exhibited for the first time in human history. That's true of the Bitcoin blockchain 
And it's true of the Ethereum mainnet, which is the second large blockchain, which I'm going to tell you more about. That's where I particularly focus most. Um, public blockchains tend to be um, not very scalable, not very fast. They are not optimized for speed. They are optimized for security. They are optimized in such a way to make it so that bad actors, hackers, um, nation state level threat vectors, for example, cannot tamper with the data and cannot take down the system. Literally can't. It's, that, is, that is the goal of, of public blockchains, such that even if a, if a government went rogue, one government in the world went rogue, they, it cannot be deleted, it cannot be changed. Um, and and those, are, those are very powerful things for things like land rights, for example, or the, uh, the ability to possibly have a money that is not connected to a nation state, which is how all of this originated, but not where I personally focus because I'm looking at how to use this to great effect in our industry. Uh, then the same technology that can run public infrastructures can also be implemented in private networks. The private networks are dramatically more scalable uh, by orders of magnitude. So you can have very fast production systems, very high throughput, et cetera. And what you're trading off is the degree to which the decentralization effect is, is present and the level of security of that system. For example, let's say you had an enterprise blockchain network, which means usually a private network, uh, and you had 12 corporations that were all members of that network. Well, if all 12 corporations colluded and decided to undertake a fraud, for example, the technology could not prevent that. So, so it's, it's a balance between uh, security and decentralization and throughput and, and scalability versus uh, speed, privacy and, 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 and factors along those lines. And then finally, the, the pattern that I personally believe, or my hypothesis is that the hybrid pattern is what's going to end up being appropriate for our industry. That's where you have a private blockchain network that is connected or tethered to a large neutral public blockchain network. They operate at different speeds. They have different ownership and control structures. They have different postures for privacy and transparency. Uh, they are substantially different, but because they are connected, it allows you to have discoverability. It allows you to find resources. Imagine our internet today, if you couldn't search for something and any business process, any clinical workflow, any scientific process that had to be undertaken involves somebody sending an email or a fax or making a phone call or having a meeting. That kind of friction won't work at scale and automation demands discoverability. And that's the key of why I believe that hybrid blockchain networks are going to be what actually works for our industry. On top of the blockchain networks themselves, uh, there are something called smart contracts which are neither smart nor contracts. All I can do is apologize for the name. I did not, I did not name it, uh, but smart contracts are, are microservices, very small pieces of software that provide a certain discrete function. Uh, blockchain networks, particularly the Ethereum mainnet, not, not the Bitcoin blockchain, but the Ethereum mainnet runs smart contracts, which means that in addition to simply securing data being persisted across the whole network, it also can execute any function. It makes it effectively uh, a giant world computer that can run software of all forms. And that software is written in the form of smart contracts. What it enables us to do is to have orchestration across organizational boundaries. That sounds a lot like the holy grail of care coordination across organizational boundaries, right? And that's, uh, that's a very important dynamic of what smart contracts can deliver. Uh, blockchain networks can be tokenized. There are many different blockchain protocols. Uh, the Ethereum protocol where I focused is natively tokenized. 
Uh, when you run it on the public mainnet, it is running a cryptocurrency called ETH or Ether. And that is how it is operating. That's where the behavioral economic dynamics, which is outside of the scope of this talk, but I'm happy to describe more if it comes up in the Q&A. In enterprise or private blockchain networks, it is not necessary to use tokens at all. You would only do so if it made business sense. They're optional. But what's key about tokenization is it creates digital scarcity. So if you, if you remember your economics and supply and demand and the role of scarcity, uh, we've never had that uh, because our current technology paradigm is such that data can be infinitely copied. So there's no scarcity when it comes to data at its fundamental level because it can just be copied and copied and copied. Tokens, not so. Uh, tokens, whether they're fungible or non-fungible, cannot just be infinitely copied and they require a particular paradigm to operate them and they effectively create scarcity, which is why the game theoretical approaches and the behavioral economic approaches can work in a blockchain ecosystem, but they could never work in our legacy technical environment. And then last, uh, decentralized apps or dApps is what you call a, a user-facing piece of software that uh, is built on blockchain. And uh, we at Consensus Health at my organization are working with this family of technologies plus two others. My position is that blockchain technology is necessary for the transformation of our industry with respect to our problems and challenges with illiquid, low integrity, siloed health information, uh, but it's not sufficient. So necessary, but not sufficient. What would make it sufficient? Well, it's the introduction of two additional families of emerging technology. And that's what I call privacy in depth, which is not one thing, but a whole basket of new technologies I'm gonna tell you about. And then decentralized AI. Machine learning is already a very big deal in our field, as you all know, but we have inherent limitations that we can overcome by decentralizing artificial intelligence. So in summary, major characteristics of blockchain is that it's decentralized. Public blockchains are transparent. Private blockchains are not. All blockchain uh, data structures deliver a degree of immutability of that data that doesn't exist in any of our legacy infrastructures. Depending on how they're architected and designed, they can be neutral. If you're talking about something like the Ethereum mainnet, it's absolutely neutral. No corporation, no government owns it and controls it. That's what makes it neutral. And if it's public, it is by definition open access. Private blockchain networks are not necessarily open access. And then there's many different technologies under the hood here. Uh, but the thing is that when you implement uh, a blockchain architecture, you are designing different things to meet the use case. And generally what you're doing is making trade-offs between three things, and that's why they call it the trilemma. And those things are scalability, security, and decentralization, which maps to neutrality. All right, so we have a number of barriers of, to adoption here. I think of them in these five categories, uh, cybersecurity, compliance, privacy, identity, and bioethics. Each of these is positively and negatively impacted by the introduction of these emerging technologies. One, one point that I hold dear is that uh, this is a new technology paradigm of the same magnitude as the dawn of the commercial internet. Uh, it is the same, I, I think of it as, you know, the Gutenberg printing press, the steam engine, the integrated circuit, you know, all the way to this kind of new technology paradigm. In our past technology paradigms in healthcare, we have unfortunately left large segments of the population behind. We have what's called the digital divide. And in this pandemic, it has become abundantly clear that humanity has become dependent upon access to digital health and that a fully inclusive digital health environment is now as important as, as food and shelter. Uh, and, the, and what we want to do is see this new technology adopted in an ethically intentional way that prevents the deepening and worsening of health disparities that are already crushing in many places around the world, including here in the United States. 
If we fail to learn from past mistakes with the introduction of technology into healthcare, think about all the unintended consequences that have occurred due to the digitization of healthcare. When I first entered the field, uh, physician suicide was not a thing. Now it's a tragedy because of because of a range of a range of things that has resulted ultimately from the digitization and the corporatization of the practice of medicine. There are those are examples of reasons why we must be ethically intentional today as we are on the brink of a, of a completely new technical paradigm. So often there's questions about what's practical, what's the low hanging fruit versus what's further afield uh, in our industry. And uh, I developed this framework several years ago to articulate the pattern that I was observing. Uh, it's called the PHI readiness framework. I'm sure everyone here is familiar with PHI, but if you're not, it's protected health information, which is a defined term under the US HIPAA law and, and similar terms in every, every nation around the world. It involves identified clinical information. Um, so this framework juxtaposes time and PHI involvement with population health impact and articulates three stages of transformation. I have a whole talk that I give just on this framework, but I wanted to quickly show you that those things in stage one are already getting traction and they involve no PHI at all. And that highlights the issues of compliance and privacy and cybersecurity and many, many concerns that we can't just brush over. Then in stage three, we see lots of things that I put in the holy grail category that would be enabled by this technology. Things like the you know, realizing the dream of precision medicine and true personalization, orchestrating care across clinical, uh, across organizational boundaries, uh, driving the transformation from volume to value. All those things are out there, but they all require that we are able to compute upon, transfer, and work with PHI in, these, in this new class of infrastructure. Well, I propose that there is a bridge between the two stages that is appropriate, and that is any form of IRB overseen health, re uh, health research. For anyone not familiar, that's investigational or institutional review board. It's a mechanism for ethical oversight and, and human research protection. And it and by research, I could I mean anything from a, a double blinded randomized uh, controlled trial to uh, a registry that still requires oversight, which is just a a, a, a prospective tracking uh, infrastructure. All forms that, that have that kind of ethical oversight have a common uh, set of qualities about them. And it, it, turns, it turns that piece of research into a walled garden uh, in the sense that it has its own technology infrastructure. It has its own data management approach. It has its own governance and oversight. It always has its own funding source separate from the practice of mainstream medicine. All of those things and more make it not only ethically appropriate, but necessary to adopt this technology under research constructs so that we can learn uh, what claims can actually be made about the infrastructures that are made possible with this technology, while at the same time answering important research questions in a way that delivers superior data integrity uh, because the, the reproducibility and replicability crisis in clinical research is, is massive. So we can be adding value on two fronts at once. So anything that is possible in stage three in mainstream medicine, I argue is possible today under a well-designed study in stage two. So a couple of, uh, a couple of things for, uh, that I, I hope will help when you start to understand this idea of federation and what it would mean for healthcare and life sciences. First of all, centralization is the status quo. All the systems that you're used to, EHRs, they're centralized. Enterprise information systems, they're centralized. And in order to compute own data, in order to analyze it, you have to first move it someplace uh, and centralize it. What I'm gonna be telling you about now is a new approach that is not blockchain intrinsically, but facilitated by blockchain being used as an access control layer effectively. But we have to understand there's new semantics because if you just use the word data by itself, it ceases to be meaningful. 
uh, because you're using data in so many different ways and contexts. So I'm gonna encourage us to use three terms to define data. Um, metadata, everyone already is familiar with that one. That's data about data, data describing data. Source data is, uh, for example, enterprise data that lives behind a corporate firewall. Uh, or patient self-sovereign data that maybe lives on their cell phone, et cetera. That's source data. And derived data are analytical findings. That's actually what's valuable. That's what we're all after. Uh, however, uh, we tend to, we don't trust analytics that we didn't perform ourselves. And by ourselves, I mean a corporation, a government, et cetera. We have to get the source data verify where we got it, perform our own analytics in order to trust the findings. That is a trust problem. And foundationally, that is, that is the part of the picture that blockchain resolves. Now, source data has been exponentially expanding for the last 15 years, and it's only radically increasing. And the, the internet of, of things and the internet of medical things particularly is exploding as 5G is being rolled out. So the, the bottom line here is that we've, we've reached the logistical extremes of centralizing data as the way of getting value out of it. And my assertion is that we are now living in a sunsetting paradigm, like what mainframe computers were before, before the web, you know, and before the client server architectures, there was a time when we were still in that paradigm, but it was sunsetting. In the emerging paradigm, uh, the, the creation of value from data is going to be rapid, automated, quality controlled, and trusted. But where we live today, right now, it's slow and labor intensive, it's error prone, and it's untrusted. Uh, in, the, in the sunsetting paradigm, we have to move data from place to place, copying it all the time. Very often, to address compliance, uh, you know, good compliance reasons, we have to de-identify data, particularly public health data. Uh, this introduces enormous challenges that if you're unfamiliar with them, you would be amazed at the armies of data scientists that our industry has to employ working with public health data to try to bring longitudinality back to the data that had been stripped out in the de-identification process. Um, in the emerging paradigm, the data stays at rest. You're able to analyze it exactly where it's already sitting. Instead of bringing the data to a centralized place where you can compute upon it, instead, you're bringing the algorithm or the computational capability to the edge where the data resides. resides. You're normalizing it locally and you're distributing rule sets out to all of the data silos. Ultimately, the data can be analyzed right where it sits as well. And only the derived data is what is shared in uh, federated networks that are facilitated by blockchain. So uh, we've been talking about person -centric centricity and patient centeredness for a really long time in this industry. We're at the point now uh, in, in the US with the last stages of implementation of the 21st Century Cures Act and the anti-information blocking provisions that we need a, a new set of person-centered architectural components in order to, uh, in order to accommodate the, the, the having reached the logistic extremes of data centralization. Those, uh, those five components are self-sovereign identity, verifiable credentials, biometric workflows, a self-sovereign data lake where N equals one, and an ability to work with tokenized value. And those five things have to work together around a person that gives them brand new, very powerful mechanisms to engage with enterprises. Ultimately, what this means is that we're, we're gonna be able to move from data silos to being able to implement crypto economic, behavioral economic incentive systems that make it more worthwhile for parties to collaborate using their data than to hoard their data. All of this leads to uh, what I call uh, real-time, real-world evidence uh, and the acceleration of research ultimately for faster miracles. Um, I'm, we believe that federated machine learning, at least in terms of retrospective analyses and prediction, is absolutely the future. 
and that without the blockchain layer, uh, federated machine learning has no shared access control that can work across many organizations. Um, so I mentioned that uh, there are two other families of technologies that, that, uh, that are necessary. Um, the first of them is privacy in depth. These, this is a list of all of the new technologies that are part of privacy in depth. The first thing I wanna let you know with respect to cryptography, the cryptography that secures every single block in a blockchain is actually old cryptography, nothing new. It's been in production for 30, 40 years. It's, it's nothing new or novel. It's just that it's been put together and used in a new and novel way. But zero knowledge cryptography, zero knowledge cryptography and zero knowledge proofs is brand new. Brand new math implemented in computer science for the first time in history only about seven or eight years ago and just now getting to global industrial scale. But zero knowledge proofs are critically important for you to know what they are. You don't have to know the math, you don't have to know how it works, but the key is that it lets you, it lets a, a piece of software run a computation on data, say on your cell phone. And instead of having to send the data, like your birth date, for example, that piece of software can instead return a cryptographic proof that says yes or no, your birth date passed or failed some test. And so many of our workflows in our industry today require us to send data to and fro in order for our workflow to flow. But with the introduction of zero knowledge proofs at global industrial scale, what that means is that the number of scenarios where you have to exchange data, it goes from being the norm to being an exception case. There still will be times when data actually has to be transferred, but it will be uh, much less common than it is today, which is, which is going to bring uh, enormous value. I'm not gonna talk about the rest of these other than just to quickly mention trusted execution environments, which are hardware security modules that can be implemented on the cloud or locally on mobile devices. And what they do is they create a, a cryptographic memory space or compute space so that even the operating system of the computer that's running it cannot see what's happening inside that crypto bubble, if you will. And then the third family of technologies that we are integrating with blockchain is decentralized AI. Um, federated learning includes, includes not only the learning mechanism, but also inference, which is the, the uh, using, using uh, uh, making a prediction effectively and being able to do so in a secure and verifiable way so that you can be certain that the, the thing that's making the prediction that might be guiding patient behavior, for example, or God forbid guiding clinical behavior choices, can actually be assured that it hasn't been corrupted, hacked, or otherwise tampered with. So the uh, being able to implement federated compute networks and leverage public infrastructures with private blockchains is very important. In the interest of time, I'm going to move on from here and just let you know that the public infrastructure of the Ethereum mainnet is how you can discover resources, identities, etc. And then that work, the work, gets offloaded into private networks that are bridged or tethered. Ultimately, this leads to, the, the, creates the potential for total care engagement uh, that leverages gamification, behavioral economics, and tokenomics. Uh, and if you think of our industry as being defined by the distorted incentives that characterize all of the different stakeholder groups, this gives us the first opportunity in history to form a hypothesis about what kind of incentive structure among the various stakeholder groups might work and then actually implement it and iteratively learn and ultimately perform what is a classic, uh, classic use for artificial intelligence, which is optimization of complex adaptive systems that exceed the human intellect's ability to, uh, to optimize. So with that, I'm excited to take questions. Uh, I, that, was a, that was a lot in a short period of time, but we've got um, plenty of time for Q&A. Great, thank you so much, Heather, for your amazing presentation on blockchain technologies in healthcare. 
I have one question for you and some other questions I also wrote down as of right now. I'm sure there'll be plenty more as we go on in our discussion. Um, as you describe the different blockchain technologies utilized in healthcare, how can us pre-health students become more familiarized with this technology and how would it be useful in our future careers as doctors um, sure. and doctoral students? So I think that one of the most important things that needs to happen to see our major problems in our industry solved is that uh, we can't, add, I'm, I'm not a provider, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur in our field. But what we can't have are the corporate interests and the government interests that run healthcare and life sciences take the entire practice of medicine, digitize it, make it part of the administrative costs of medicine, and disenfranchise physicians and clinicians and providers from that process. Um, increasingly, it, what used to be the triple aim is now the quadruple aim and provider experience, everyone understands, is at a crisis level. That in large part has to do with the, the growth of administrative medicine and the digitization of the practice of medicine. And, and those, those uh, implications have had enormous, some positive and enormous negative unintended consequences. So as a pre-health professional, what I would tell you is that you can't leave the understanding of the technology to others. That, that it's important, not that you understand it at the level that you could build it, for example, but that you understand fundamentals and that you understand that medicine isn't a non-technical discipline anymore from an IT perspective. Every single thing we do is using, is using machine learning. Every problem that we have in the industry, every uh, waste, fraud, and abuse, um, uh, medical error, et cetera, et cetera, comes back to data. And it's in the infrastructures that control and govern it. So the, whether you are personally a user of the technology, you will be a critical voice in shaping the future of medicine. And in that, uh, be an empowered stakeholder. And that requires you to understand. So, so learn, it would be, my, would, would be my guidance. And the most practical way to do that is the Health Information Management System Society, HIMSS. They are the health IT professional society, more than 60,000 members. And there are you know, thousands and thousands of clinicians who practice medicine, but are also members of HIMSS because they have learned how critical this whole technology infrastructure and data thing actually is. And uh, they have very, very great uh, student programs. And uh, I've been part of some of them. I'm honored uh, you know, to, be, to be part of supporting those programs whenever possible. It's, it's himss.org. And uh, that would be my number one suggestion. And if you wanna learn about this protect particular technology, um, we have a blockchain task force and I co-chair it and we have put out tremendous amounts of great content, peer reviewed papers, um, it, webinars, other resources. It's all available on the HIMSS website. And, and I, I would say it's a trusted, neutral, unbiased source of uh, health relevant, health contextualized information. Thank you so much for that answer. As a pre-health student, I am very, very interested in this technology, even though I have no computer science background whatsoever, but I've heard people similar to you and entrepreneurs talk about how being aware of this technology is so important for anybody of any background because it is seen in almost every industry. So thank you so much for that input. Our next question is, how have you seen machine learning grow in healthcare? And what are some specific examples? Sure. So I've been in healthcare. So my career started in the mid nineties. And, uh, and I've been in healthcare continuously since 2005. So just to give you a sense of this spectrum of time, um, machine learning has, it has a storied 
past in healthcare because there's there's incredible potential but there's also really substantial risks and uh, so so to give you an example of something wonderful and an example of something terrible uh, so that you can see the the technology itself is completely neutral uh, but but uh, in in the event that the data that it's being trained on or the infrastructures it's being trained on are unintentionally not neutral you can be you can be teaching a machine intelligence something you don't want to teach it uh, and not even know that that's happening so so machine learning in healthcare uh, has been able to radically enhance the uh, being able to capture um, tumors, for example, off, off of imaging files. So, so uh, there are well-studied uh, rates of errors that radiologists make, for example, when they're looking at imaging files in, uh, you know, screening for tumors in many different cancers. And uh, we've been able to take those imaging data and have a training set where a human being had to confirm that that in fact is an image of a tumor. We know that for sure. And then here's a whole bunch of images where we think they're, the person's healthy. And we've been able to use those images to train machine learning algorithms to be able to ingest an image, a, a radiological image like that and put out a, an answer. There is or is not a tumor here. And those answers occur at a higher level of, of accuracy than radiologists can deliver, substantially so. So much so, even though radiologists themselves might possibly feel threatened by having technology overtake their work, most radiologists are strongly in favor of that because the patient comes first and, and we're human beings and mistakes happen. And if there are ways we can strip errors that save lives, well, everyone is in favor of that. And that's absolutely wonderful. Um, an example of the, the dark side and what we have to be careful about is there are, um, I'm not going to mention the names of corporations because all the parties involved are people that I respect and admire and the mistakes that were made uh, were made unintentionally. But uh, there have been um, litigations brought of uh, machine learning algorithms making uh, racist decisions when they were automating different patients through a clinical flow. And, uh, and those racist decisions resulted in uh, Caucasians receiving superior care by compared, comparison to black Americans in the same health systems through no other explanation than the functioning of, a, um, of an algorithm that had been trained on let's say regular institutional data. And the, the implications you know, as to why that was, you know, there, we know we have health disparities. We know we have, uh, for example, a black American is 300% more likely to have significant morbidity from type two diabetes than, than a white American. Uh, that's just one example of a health disparity out of dozens and dozens of crushing disparities. Well, what this piece of software had done was look at the cost basis of a patient and was making decisions based on saving costs and, and had decided to prioritize prevention because it's always cheaper if you can prevent disease. And so it was trying to save money, it was prioritizing prevention and it was leaving some of the patients who needed care most out of a piece of software that was designed to drive um, protocol adherence. And, and uh, it's tragic and it was complete, there was no party who did that on purpose. But, uh, and, and when it was finally proven that that was what was happening, the corporation responsible immediately retired the system and has proceeded you know, with great caution uh, since that point. But it, 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 uh, it, that highlights one issue with machine learning, which is knowing where your training data came from. It's called provenance. Where did it come from? And that's one value prop that blockchain brings into these systems is that if the data is sourced via a blockchain infrastructure, you have a um, you have much less of what they call a black box problem, uh, that at least you know where your training data came from. Um, go ahead. 
Oh, you're muted. Sorry, I was just like, nodding to agree with you. I was like, oh, wow. Oh, would you like me to ask the next question? Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, how would you explain blockchain to someone who has no programming or computer science experience whatsoever? <laughs> That's often a, a test that is given in interviews from blockchain <laughs> companies where they, you know, explain blockchain to a six-year-old, uh, you know, and if you, if you can't do it, Eh, you know, you, you don't get the job. It's one I actually find particularly challenging myself personally. But uh, what I would say is that blockchain is a way of synchronizing data among different people or networks such that no one can cheat or lie about that data. And then it enables other things to happen on top of that once everyone's sure that the data hasn't been cheated on and isn't lying. And it, it, it stops people from changing anything after the fact. Perfect. Thank you for that. Um, I have a few questions that I wrote down during your presentation. What does centralization of data mean? And how have we improved technology, moved away from centralization into decentralization of data? Well, in large part, we have not yet moved away okay. from, uh, from centralization of data. Our current state, the world we live in today is still vastly centralized and the problems that we're describing here have not yet been solved. So that's, that's, the, that's the first, first thing. And then uh, there is a, um, a computer science architecture called distributed systems. And distributed systems are what run, you know, web two, our modern web, you know, things like Facebook and Twitter and et cetera. And that, that was a precursor to being able to federate data infrastructures. You first had to know how to federate software. And that, that came out of distributed systems and blockchain emerged out of distributed systems. But the, the ability to um, federate data is, has been um, a very big challenge. And our premise is that the parties that are able to put in market the first large scale platforms that first of all are person centered in the that model that I described where the data decentralization includes self-sovereign information, self-sovereign data, not only enterprise data. That's gonna be extremely powerful and, and revolutionary. And I don't think it's that far away. I don't, I, I'm not, I don't think it's 10 years out. I think we're talking 12 to 18 months before we start seeing you know, major federation of, of health information. And that's gonna, that's gonna happen in the US because of the anti-information blocking provision that's kicking in under the last stages of the 21st Century Cures Act. And uh, that'll, be, that'll be a really substantive change. Um, I will, oh, I have to credit Apple. So if any of you are users of the Apple Health Kit, and uh, you have been gathering self-sovereign data through that health kit and it's residing locally on your devices. And then Apple can help you participate in Apple research through their Apple research app. Those are uses of federated data infrastructures that are probably the furthest along that we've come so far. So good for Apple. Thank you so much for that response. Follow up question to that, how would those changes apply to the healthcare industry for specifically medical professionals and medical researchers? Well, um, my chief scientific officer is a gentleman by the name of uh, Dr. Sean Mannion. He says something all the time that cracks me up, which is that scientists would rather share toothbrushes than data. Uh, the, there is a, a strong reluctance to, to allow your, the, the data that you collect while, while performing clinical or basic research to be shared by others, because if it were, it could be corrupted. Something could go wrong. It could destroy your research. Well, the, the implication is that there will be data sharing and data use, because it, it will become possible to use data analytically without moving it at all. 
And then it will also be possible to exchange it and still then prove that it wasn't tampered with later. And that, those implications are really game changing for, for medicine and clinical research both. So the thing to know is if you're using a clinical trials management system, what is its architecture? Soon, there will be lots and lots of clinical trials management systems that are blockchain based. Uh, it will mean though that you can't go back and correct your data, which is, you know, you're not supposed to do that anyway, but people do it all the time. That practice will end <laughs> because it will be impossible to do that. Thank you so much. Another question from the audience. How do you suggest we go about general education of blockchain technology, where even today students aren't always educated on how our current internet actually works? Yeah, that's tough. I, um, I'll admit that I, I am personally self-educated on all of these matters. And I'm a voracious autodidact. And I think that you have to let your curiosity drive. If you are sufficiently curious and you really want to understand how things work, then you'll be motivated to learn on your own time. I would not trust academia to be responsible for your ability to fully understand the world you're moving into. Um, human, human bureaucracies have not changed their pace, uh, but the acceleration of new technology is, is in, increasing exponentially and everything's converging. If you wanna understand that, you can't expect an institution to develop curricula and teach it to you. I would just say you have to own that yourself and let your curiosity drive you. Um, I, I will again reiterate on these topics particularly, HIMSS is a terrific resource for everything at the intersection of healthcare and information technology, not just blockchain, cybersecurity, identity, clinical informatics, you name it. Um, and, and becoming a student member and then starting to go to the conferences when they come back and, uh, and engaging in HIMSS as early as possible is, is a terrific way to get immersion around that. Perfect, thank you so much for that response. Another question, for students interested in learning more about these technologies or for future medical students and healthcare professionals who are interested in learning how to teach machines to do anything, something yes. that allows them to aid their research or their work, how would you recommend someone with no computer science background to pursue something like that in that education as a self-educator? Yes, so it's, it's a really interesting thing, um, thinking about the practice of medicine and population health or um, discovering new interventions, um, new therapeutics, et cetera, as being as much a function of machine learning as something you would do in a lab. Like that's really unintuitive, uh, but it's now well understood by our industry that we are sitting on a massive treasure trove of potential. And if you have a creative, you know, scientifically grounded hypothesis that you would like to pursue, where you think some human clinical decision could be improved, optimized, and automated, and done at scale, then what I would suggest that you do, first of all, continue to become a domain expert in that particular field. You know, don't, don't, don't take the foot, your foot off the gas in being the domain expert in that particular field. But at your university, go find the computer science department and find the people that are teaching and learning and doing AI. And they want exactly what you just described. They, they are computer scientists first and healthcare people distantly. Way back over here, they might you know, they might understand some things about healthcare. If you, if you go to those organizations and propose joint research, uh, those, those, th that kind of interdisciplinary collaboration is not only good, it's necessary. It's the only way it's gonna happen. It has to happen that way. So, so think of 
think of the convergence of two disciplines as 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 the way that this is actually going to happen and you can bring the the medicine the clinical expertise and the 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 concept uh to researchers in other disciplines and and do great great work together Perfect. Thank you so much for that response. I know many universities actually are starting to create blockchain technology clubs now. I know yes. Arizona State University has a blockchain, blockchain technology club. So if you go to ASU, feel free to check that out. And um, what other questions could I ask? Well, you said you wanted to wrap up at 12.55. So we are at time. I'm happy to take another question though. Yes, I have one more question actually. Just to add on to the previous one, what were any specific resources online that could teach us technologies like these? Do you know any websites or anything other than HIMSS that we could check out? Uh, yes, so there is the IEEE Blockchain Initiative. I'm also involved with that one and that if I, I believe the URL is blockchain.ieee.org and you can find my standard under the family of blockchain standards that go across industries, agriculture, energy, et cetera. I chair the healthcare activity. Um, the Linux Foundation, the Linux Foundation has something called the Hyperledger Project, which is actually 16 different blockchain code bases. Under Hyperledger, there is the Healthcare Special Interest Group, and you can join the Healthcare Special Interest Group uh, under Hyperledger as a way of getting engaged in how all of these technologies are working specifically in healthcare. And that's another organization I'm involved in. So Linux Foundation, Healthcare Special Interest Group, IEEE Blockchain Initiative under healthcare, of course, HIMSS, will give you the blockchain task force content, but also give you much, much more. It's, it, it's, it's the field of health information technology is vast <laughs> and it will, it will give you a much broader base of understanding. Uh, so I hope, I hope that's helpful. It is extremely helpful. I know I'm definitely going to check those out after our presentation today. Okay. Thank you so much much for joining us Heather. Oh, it, was it was so an honor to hear from you and I hope that I'd be able to have future discussions with you and if any of our attendees want to reach out to you I would ask them to email me or mphc at nationalfreehealthconf.org so we can connect them to you Ms. Flannery or Consensus Health and other administrators there. Thank you so much for joining us and we hope you have a great rest of your weekend. All right take care. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. All right, everybody. We are going to transition into our lunch break. It is one hour and we will be back at 2 p.m. So get up, get a drink of water, grab a snack, eat lunch. If it's 12 around there, it's like still early in the morning here. So I might have breakfast now, <laughs> pretty exciting. And we will have our announcements on loop during your lunch break. So if you would like to eat your food in front of the computer and see the different announcements going on, feel free to do so. All right. And we will be back at 2 p.m. Eastern time. <laughs>